Hey, Crossroads family, uh, Pastor Mark Spanzel here. Uh, this is a bit of our new normal. And uh, though we don't have our men's, women's studies, we're gonna spend some Monday nights together for at least a few weeks and uh, look at the word of God together. Before we get into God's word, uh, I just wanna say a few things. First of all, I care about you deeply, care about your safety. Um, please uh, do all you can to uh, take care of yourself, take care of your family. Uh, take any precautions that are necessary uh, physically to get through this. Uh, as one of your pastors, I care uh, ab about your physical safety, but I care about your spiritual growth uh, more. Uh, I, I want you to go deep. Uh, I want this to be a season where we all get to experience the powerful working of the Spirit of God uh, in us. Uh, I think this is an unprecedented opportunity for us to grow in the Lord. Of course, I never would have planned it this way. Uh, I wouldn't wish this on anybody, but nonetheless, here we are. And let's not waste the moment to go deep, uh, to not just occupy ourselves, to amuse ourselves, um, but rather to, uh, to really press in. And one of the ways we wanna do that is studying the Bible together. Uh, this is a little bit of a different format. We're not sitting in a living room or even in a classroom where we get to have some dialogue about the text of Scripture together. Uh, this isn't our Sunday morning exposition verse by verse uh, either. And so we'll just see how it goes. Uh, I invite you to, to grab your Bible, maybe grab a journal, uh, some place to take notes. Uh, there's a downloadable handout where you clicked to start this video that you can access that will give you uh, an outline of what we're gonna go through as well as some discussion questions, some things to think about, reflect on for you personally and perhaps for you uh, as a family or as a group of brothers and sisters. Um, some exercises to deepen your spiritual life, to make the Word of God applicable as we move forward, as well as um, some things that you can study a little bit further since we're gonna move at kind of a rapid pace through the study uh, during our Wilderness 2.0. The word that the Lord keeps bringing to mind to me is the word disruption. Uh, I feel it, I feel it in my own soul, don't you? Disruption, uh, the shaking of our lives and what comes out. Um, we're going to see the best and the worst of each other during this time. And let's not waste that. I've already had some moments in my own life with eight people in our home, all on one Wi-Fi system, trying to work online or do our homework uh, sessions online. And uh, we just, we're bumping into each other and you see what comes out. That's good. Let's not miss those moments. This, this idea of disruption uh, couples for me with this idea of just being set free. We all feel a bit like we're in bondage, <laughs> we're in lockdown. Uh, certainly don't wanna minimize those who have actually experienced incarceration. We recognize that it's not that. But life is different and we feel it. We feel, uh, we feel the walls closing in on us. Uh, we feel the shaking of disruption and we want to live in freedom. That's what I want for you. With those words in mind, the book of the Bible that the Lord kept bringing to my mind and to my heart was the book of Galatians. And I, I want us to look at the book of Galatians as we gather on these Monday nights because I want freedom for you. Uh, is exactly what Paul was fighting for with the Galatian churches. Just consider even the, the key verse of Galatians. It's found in Galatians chapter five, verse one, where Paul writes, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, by the time we get to chapters five and six of this little epistle that Paul wrote to the Galatian churches, we have two of the most fundamental concepts for our spiritual growth. In chapter five, we get the concept of walking by the Spirit, or as he puts, puts it, keeping in step with the Spirit. And then we get to chapter six, and he talks about uh, bearing one another's burdens, this idea of loving one another, serving one another. Really, it's that idea of loving God, keeping in step with the Spirit, and loving each other, and practicing the biblical one another's together. If we use this time in our life for no other reason than to uh, understand to a, a deeper degree what it looks like to walk in the Spirit 
and to love one another, then this will all have been exponentially worth it. Uh, Disruption has come to the Galatian churches. And what gets shaken up in them is, is very instructive for us because the disruption in our lives can really produce one of two things. It can either produce uh, what we'll see from the Galatian church, it's a desertion, um, bondage, more bondage, uh, addiction to comfort, to the idols of our life, our heart, or that disruption can shake us free of some of those uh, enslaving idols. It can shake us free and disrupt us from what we have put our hope and confidence and comfort in, and we can go deeper in devotion. And so as we jump into Galatians uh, Galatians chapter one, let me pray for us. Uh, Ask the spirit of God to to use this time even as we are experiencing together over the computer. Uh, Spirit of God, would you meet each of us where we're at in our homes, offices, Um, living rooms, would you use your word to instruct us? It is the sword of the spirit. I pray that you'd help me to serve my brothers and sisters well, even with them not sitting in the room here with me. I pray that this would be a, a season of unprecedented spiritual growth for us, for me, for our church, And we know that you're the only one that can do that. So we pray for holy disruptions that will lead us to greater devotion. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, I hope you have your Bible. Uh, You're open to Galatians chapter one. We'll dig in together. Um, I'm just gonna walk through this so that there is space for you to go back, uh, read through, Uh, Mark your Bible up, take some notes, talk together later like you might in uh, a more normal Bible study session. You see, the sad reality as we approach this book of Galatians is that like the Galatian churches, there are many of us who have claimed the completed work of Christ. We believe the gospel. We know that it's what has set us free from our sin. And yet uh, we, like the Galatian churches, don't always live in that freedom. This was what they were experiencing. They had begun in faith. They had begun trusting that it was the spirit that had set them free. And they were now about the proud confidence of their best efforts, uh, the keeping of special days, the keeping of the law. They were looking to control the outcomes. They were patting each other on the back for their brilliant achievements and their hard work. All of those things that I just listed are destroyers of gospel freedom. Let me just give you a quick context for the book of Galatians. Uh, Paul had come, he had planted this church. Uh, These churches, this is actually a group of churches, the Galatian churches. He had taught them the gospel. They had embraced it. They loved it. He had set up elders in these churches. He had taught them how to do church. And within a short amount of time, perhaps uh, just a few years, they had deserted the pure, unadulterated gospel that had been preached to them. They had embraced another gospel, which Paul says was no gospel at all. Now, Galatians, arguably, is Paul's first letter written. Uh, It's hastily written. Paul says that he wrote it in his own hand. You see his passion for the gospel all over the pages of the book of Galatians. It's just him pouring out concern for the disruption that has come to this region that has caused them to turn their back on the work of Christ, or at least bring in other things and muddy the gospel, making it no gospel at all. Here in Galatians and in Romans, Paul gives us the the greatest of his treatises on salvation. And what is his message? His message is the work of Christ and the power of the Spirit is enough. You don't need to add anything to it. It is sufficient. It is adequate. It is that which has saved us, that will sanctify us, and that will lead us all the way to glory, the finished work of Christ and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. These churches, though, had abandoned that. They weren't free. 
they needed the, the prison key of the gospel, as it were, handed back to them to unlock them from this invisible slavery of a dead, lifeless, man-centered religion. They needed, here's our word again, they needed some disruption, and Paul brings it. One of the things that, uh, that I, I just pray that you will fight during this time is the thinking that says something to the effect of, I just can't wait till things get back to normal. Please, brothers and sisters, fight that. We want God to do something in our lives during this very abnormal season that doesn't just get us back to where we were and our old normal, but we want him to do some shaking, some freeing, some disrupting by the power of the Holy Spirit such that we let go of some of those things that were so attached to us the way that we did life, the way that we did relationship, such that we don't want to go back to how things were before. Let me give you an outline of chapter one. We're going to just take this a chapter at a time. So for uh, this week, Galatians chapter one, uh, I've called it three portraits of gospel disruption. First, we see this radical deliverance in what Christ did through his work on the cross that is available to all of us. And then we see a disastrous desertion that is the, the disrupting that happened among the Galatian churches and they deserted. And then there is this miraculous transformation, which is essentially the Apostle Paul's testimony, the disruption that turned Saul into Paul. Three portraits of gospel disruption. First, a radical deliverance. This is found in verses one to five. Let me read as you follow along. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll just stop there and consider this radical deliverance. Now, Paul does introduce himself, as is the case in his epistles. And to whom he's writing, the churches of Galatia, he gives a bit of a greeting, grace to you and peace there in verse three. But by the time we get to verse four, I mean, he has jumped in fast. And then when we get to the next section, you'll see he is furiously writing because he is so concerned for the desertion that's happened in these churches. The false Jewish teachers have introduced air. We call these guys the Judaizers. They were appealing to the flesh. They were saying things like, you need more than the gospel. You need to, to, to bring back in the law. You need to do more. You need to achieve more. You need to work harder. For them, in their context, the, the biblical history of it was things like circumcision, works of the law, celebrating certain days and festivals, to which you say, well, that can't be all that bad, right? It was disastrous. But it does appeal to the flesh. Uh, if you know me at all, I'm someone that likes my to-do lists. I like to be able to measure my progress by uh, check boxes, crossed off to-do items. I like to be able to feel like I accomplished something, like I, I, my, my days were of, of value. That's dangerous when it comes to measuring our spiritual health or our spiritual progress that somehow if I can just check the boxes off of doing the right things, I am somehow growing in grace when in fact I might have bought into a completely false gospel, a gospel of my own making. We might call it works righteousness, a dead lifeless religion, a man-centeredness that has the trappings of a Bible and a doctrine words but isn't one that is free to live according to the power of the spirit that so powerfully operates within me. 
See, that's just not how spiritual progress works, this lie of the false gospel that the Judaizers were bringing into these Galatian churches. Life in the spirit happens internally and it is far more difficult to measure or judge or determine. Um, You and I both know there can be people that look put together on the outside people that have the the perfect marriage, the perfect family, the perfect job, that are leaders in the church, pastors, only to come to find out later that they're frauds. Spiritual progress, rather, brothers and sisters, is measured by this abiding in Christ that more often than not doesn't make headline news, isn't about flash and sort of all the the external accomplishments that that were all too quick to cite as spiritual maturity. See, to understand this kind of freedom, this for freedom, you've been set free. You've been set free in the gospel, but are you living in the freedom? You've been freed to live freely. It's an odd sort of statement that we see there in Galatians chapter five, verse one. But actually, it makes all the sense in the world when you understand how the spiritual life works. Set free at the cross to now live free. Galatians weren't living free. Verses four and five is the meat of this first portrait of radical deliverance. Look back at it. Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In these two verses, we get this succinct picture of the very mission of the Lord Jesus Christ coming from heaven to earth, incarnation. It was a rescue mission to save mankind and to save us from what? Well, he's saving us From our sins, it says, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us, what else? From this present evil age that we live in. And he did it according to the will of our God and Father. He sent from the Father on a mission, from the Father, a missionary to planet Earth to be uh, God, very God, in human flesh, to rescue mankind from their sins, deliver us from this present evil age. This is the will of his father who sent him. Then it says in verse five, to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. Let's just unpack that a little bit. Think about this a little bit. Go back to this and consider this. We were slaves to sin. We were citizens of this evil age. We were committed to self-reliance. We were addicted to personal glory. This is, this is who we were. We don't like dwelling on these things. And, the, and, and, and frankly, it's not, it's not helpful for us to dwell on who we were other than to remember the glorious deliverance that has been accomplished for us. This was not of our undoing, of our own doing. This wasn't anything we deserved. We were slaves to our sin. We were addicted to our own glory. We were citizens of this present evil age. It's not a good state. And then there is this key word that we see in verse four. It's the Greek word ek areo, and it means to remove or to take out. It's translated in the ESV as to deliver. He delivered us. And the tense of the word is that which points to a a point in time that we were delivered with ongoing effect. There was a point in time where the Galatian churches were delivered out of the present evil age. There is a point in time where I was delivered out of this present evil age, where you were delivered out of this present evil age, and it has ongoing effect. Does it, is the question. Does it have ongoing effect? Or is it just that you sort of, yeah, yeah, I trust the Lord when I was five, VBS, or 
you know, I heard the gospel and then said amen, and yet it doesn't have an ongoing effect. This was, again, one of these disruptions that we see coming out in the way the Galatians were no longer living in the freedom of having been delivered out of the present evil age. The idea is that they've been, or that we've been removed from an association, removed from the world's ways. Just think about that. We're no longer owned by the culture around us. We're no longer owned by the circumstances that we're facing. They don't own us. They don't control us. If we are controlled by the spirit, then we are not controlled by a spirit of fear. We are not controlled by what comes out of the White House, by what comes on headline news. We are not owned by this system that we are operating in. Jesus came He held the key to our rescue. He opened the prison door and he took us out. That's what he's saying here in verse four. He delivered us. Now, it's not to separate us from the present world, but he delivered us out from, catch this, slavery to this present world. We have been rather delivered too now if we go back in verses four and five and work out where we were and where where we are now. He gave himself up for our sins. In other words, now we know forgiveness. We have no longer bear the wrath of God against our sin. It was taken for us. He delivered us from this present evil age, meaning now we are citizens of a better place. We are citizens of heaven. Our identity is in Christ. This was according to the will of our God and Father. The will of God is being unfolded in our lives now. This is, he is king, he is Lord, he is master. This is about his glory, verse five. We are now free from that insatiable desire to get glory for ourselves, to be accepted, to be adored. And if we go back up to verses one and two, we actually see that Paul understood this. He says, as he introduces this book to the Galatian churches, Paul, an apostle, and then it says if he interrupts himself and says, not from men, I'm not an apostle because a man told me I was, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him, that is Jesus, from the dead. All that Paul just talked about there in verses four and five, he's actually living in the way he introduces himself and what he understands his call in life. This wasn't something I brought on myself. This wasn't something I was elected to do. This wasn't something a group of people voted me in for. God did this. He delivered me out, which we'll see as we get to the end of chapter one. You see, understanding our radical deliverance is really, um, friends, the first place uh, of our usefulness, of our longevity, of our joy in kingdom fruitfulness. So think about this with me before we move on to the second point. Maybe you feel stuck right now in your spiritual life, big ways, small ways, Maybe just even after a few days at home, you recognize some old patterns of your life that have crept back up that you're like, man, I thought I was past that. Or maybe there's some big looming things of of your finances, your health, and you see a fear that has gripped you. The remedy is not to try to control the outcomes, work harder, come up with the strategy. That's what the Galatians were going back to. Checkbox kind of Christianity. The remedy is to look away from ourselves to the one who delivered us. Maybe you just need to take some time, even pause the the Bible study right now and consider, do do you really appreciate the deliverance that you have? Do you really appreciate that you are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, God's beloved son? 
Are you looking for confidence in the things that you do? Or are you looking for confidence in that which has been done by Christ and the Spirit's empowering you to live no longer enslaved to this present age? And you're able to enjoy, enjoy, enjoy actually this disruption because you know God is at work to sanctify you and to increase your joy. Second portrait. First portrait, verses one to five, it's what Christ did for all. Second portrait, the Galatian churches and the disruption, what the disruption exposed in them and what it exposed is not something we wanna follow. It's a disastrous desertion. Look at verses six and seven. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, the second portrait is found in verses six to 10, but let me just stop there after verses six and seven to say, you sense it as you read it, as you hear me read it, the urgency of Paul to address the hearts and the behavior of these churches. And there's two key words here in verses six and seven that really help us sort of anchor our thoughts. The two words are deserting and distorting. The Judaizers, these false teachers had come in and they were distorting the gospel. We could add our word disrupting, right? Their distortion disrupted these churches. What did they do? They deserted. They deserted. They understood what was the gospel. Paul addresses them as churches, those who have received grace and peace. But now they've believed a lie. Make no mistake, the desertion was about doctrine. It had content. It wasn't just that other personalities came in that they liked better than Paul and they decided to follow others like we saw in the Corinthian church. There was a desertion of doctrine. But listen to how Paul puts it there in verse six. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you. This is, this is not just a desertion of ideas, of doctrines. This is a desertion of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're living in slavery, if we're living controlled by fear, if we're living addicted to our comfort and our glory, we are not just turning our back on uh, printed page in, in the Bible. We're not just turning our back on systematic theology. We're turning our back. We're living in such a way that we are deserting our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That word desertion is actually a military term. And it's worse than going AWOL. AWOL is uh, absence without leave. AWOL. You weren't given permission to leave, but you left. Desertion, the military term, is if you've been AWOL for 30 days. And in the context, even now, I was looking it up of, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Court martial. Of court martial, military law, the maximum punishment during wartime for a deserter was death. This is how serious Paul takes the desertion of the Galatian churches to a man-centered, flesh-oriented kind of Christianity, which is no gospel at all. He says basically, how could you possibly have bought into this performance-based, people-pleasing slavery? That's what it is, slavery that robs God of his glory and distorts the purity of the gospel of grace. So I'll just ask you, uh, do you struggle with people pleasing? Ever done something that you never would have thought to do, but someone else convinced you to do it because you just wanted to go along with it or it just seemed like the thing to do? There's so much swirling around us right now that, uh, I mean, case study, 
Number one, everybody else is stocking up on toilet paper, so I guess I should go stock up on toilet paper. A friend of mine said he was talking with his mom, and she was like, I don't understand all the toilet paper thing, but I was in the store and everybody was buying toilet paper, so I bought toilet paper. She didn't even know why she was buying toilet paper, but everybody else was. See, this kind of people pleasing, it can take a lot of forms. I want you to like me, and so I deceive and I manipulate. Or maybe I just try to be kind and I flatter you, I butter you up. People pleasing can take the form of wearing masks, being a chameleon, adapting to whoever I'm with, to keep the peace, to avoid conflict. It may mean that you just ignore things, don't deal with them, remain superficial. This people pleasing that the disrupting that came into the Galatian church exposed that they were more concerned about what these false teachers thought of them and buying into this false system than remaining steadfast and devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I know these tendencies in my own heart and I suspect you probably know those tendencies in your own heart too. Paul goes on, he says in verses eight to 10, but even if we, Paul and his apostolic band, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, I think I just read the same verse twice. Sorry, verse nine, pick it up. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. See, Paul is saying, it's not about me. It's not about you following me. It's not about you listening to me. The message, not the messenger, is what matters most. Even if we started to proclaim to you a different gospel or an angel came from heaven and proclaimed to you a different gospel, he says, don't believe it. It's not true. The once for all delivered message of the gospel is established, nothing to be added to it. Don't judge the message by how eloquent it comes, by how funny it is, by how polished, slick, clever. Judge it by its truthfulness to the revealed word that's come from heaven. He says to the Galatians, don't just follow me because you trust me or because you think I'm a nice guy. If it's not that the Lord Jesus Christ has come once and for all to deal a death blow to sin, and death, it's a lie. If anyone's trying to get you to add to, 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 to judge by your external behaviors, it's a lie. Don't believe it. Let that person be accursed. Practicing the law, he's saying to these churches. Practicing works. It, it doesn't just distort grace. It destroys grace. See, the great enemies of the gospel, brothers and sisters, are not those that are openly hostile and contrary to the gospel. The great enemies, listen, 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 the great enemies of the gospel are those subtle shifts that give you greater confidence in you and your chest starts to get a little bit puffed up as opposed to keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. Those little subtle shifts are the great enemy. Paul knows his commission, verse one, it's not about pleasing men, but it's about pleasing and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, if I were trying to please man, verse 10, then I couldn't be a servant of Christ. Please men, serve Christ, those are your options. Please men, serve Christ. Paul says, I understand this radical deliverance. That's the first portrait. You Galatians have been deserters and it's disastrous. And so you're about pleasing men, not serving Christ. And now we come to that final picture, which is just 
the testimony of Paul, this miraculous transformation in verses 11 to 24, the disruption that, that the Spirit of God brought to Paul's life. This is a glorious disruption. It's what I believe God's gonna do in many of our lives and hopefully our neighbors' lives and family members that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, he's gonna disrupt them, he's gonna shake them, and that is ripe for the Spirit of God to come in revival to Santa Clarita Valley, California, our nation, the world. This is the kind of time where we get shaken from man-made foundations, what we've put our confidence in, the stock market, our homes, our jobs where we realize our foundations were built on shifting sand and we get to dig down deep and place it on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul closes this chapter by simply unfolding for them his testimony. First, his life without Christ in verses 11 to 14. And I'm just gonna read through this and then let you in your own home or just you and the Lord uh, reflect on these. It's pretty straightforward. Verses 11 to 14, this is Paul's life without Christ. He says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. Because, verse 12, he says, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ, the Damascus Road experience. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. He says, look, Galatians, I know about man-made religion. I know about working hard. I know about competing and winning. And I know that that, that, that led me down a dead end road. Paul's pointing to the emptiness and the blackness of his pre-Christ existence in order to show the brilliance of this miraculous transformation that happened from Saul, persecutor, murderer, to humble servant of Christ, not about pleasing men, but wanting to serve the Lord and serve these churches. He says, Man didn't do this in me, God did it. That's true of all of us. You may have prayed with a parent, a grandparent, a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, a prayer counselor, but man didn't do your saving, God did. It's miraculous whether it happened when you were five or 50, whether you were incarcerated behind bars or whether you were incarcerated in just the addiction of your, of your own glory. It was a miraculous transformation. With Paul's, it was, it was pretty astounding. He was a religious man and he excelled in it. And he, like all before Christ, have, had a few things in common with us. Verse 13, he was given to excess in his own pursuit of, of pleasure, of that which he thought would bring him what he wanted. For him, it was, I, I persecuted to the nth degree. I was the best persecutor violently. Secondly, in verse 14, he was measuring himself against others. I was exceeding beyond others of my own age. I was winning. And third, he's given to zeal. We see that in verse 14 as well. He was zealous. In our day, we might call that word addiction. We go all in on what we think will provide rest for us, whether it's Jewish tradition like Paul or like the Judaizers were trying to get the Galatian church to buy into and they were buying into, or whether it's just our own hedonistic pleasures, comfort. That was his life before. Verses 15 to 17, we see his life invaded by Christ. Follow along as I read. But when he who had set, ap had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me 
in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. It was God's good pleasure to rescue him. Jesus is never a reluctant savior. You see that there in verse 15 and 16, God was pleased to deliver Paul. His rescue of someone here, Paul, it never, it, it always comes with a mission. You're never the end user. Paul's not the end user. He says, I was rescued in order that I might preach him to the Gentiles. It took time for him to understand, to work it out. We understand from biblical history, you can read on that handout as well, and I'll give you some more in the coming weeks, the timeline of these things. But Paul was away for three years. He was working out, like he knew the Old Testament, but now he had to reframe his understanding of the Old Testament with Jesus as the center of the Old Testament. No longer this persecutor of the church, but this is the one who came that was promised and he had to reframe his whole biblical worldview, his whole worldview. He, had, he needed time to pray. He didn't just run to the latest conference, latest book. He didn't run to Jerusalem to talk with the apostles, but he got alone to work these things out because his life had been invaded by Christ. You have this time. You have some unprecedented time that you could never plan for to sit down and to work out really where you are with the Lord, what you believe about the Lord, what you believe about your marriage, your family, your job, your, your call. I'm not telling you to, you gotta pray for five hours every day. Man, I'm, I'm saying you can, you can binge your favorite TV show, you can, you can play, play your board games, have fun with your family, with people, but don't miss having this sort of wilderness time. Todd's called it wilderness 2.0. You know, when God took his people into the wilderness coming out of Egypt, it was to test them. They were tested in the wilderness. This is gonna, this is gonna be a test for all of us. The disruption and what comes out of us, will it produce the fruit of the spirit? Will it produce a humility and a grace that is not about our own man-made systems and comforts, but is Godward in our orientation? Let me just lastly read verses 18 to 24. This is now life lived to Christ. I'll close and then you can take some time to consider this study in Galatians chapter one. He says in verse 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. He was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Verse 20, in what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went, verse 21, into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. The, they only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. What a great testimony. He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Verse 24, and they glorified God because of me. This is just Paul's sort of timeline, chain of evidence to push back against those Judaizing false teachers that were trying to, to convince the Galatian churches that Paul was a fake, that he was a sham, that his message and his mission weren't right. He says, look, I didn't get my call as a messenger from men, but from God. I didn't get the message that I deliver from men, but from God. I'm not lying. I'm not trying to just tell you what you want to hear. I am urging you to not be deserters. Let this disruption lead to devotion and not to desertion. I want you to be set free and live in that freedom. See, God changes people. We see God changed Paul, and I have no doubt that he aims to change me during this season and you and our church during this season. I just can't wait to see what comes out the other side. So take some time, 
uh, work back through Galatians chapter one. I think you're gonna find this book to be incredibly helpful and freeing, both in your understanding of God's word and the, the story of God, but also to your own soul and what it really looks like to live in the freedom that you have been set free to live into. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, take your word and push it deep into our hearts. Take it and do a disrupting work to change us, to expose what needs to be repented of, to give us a deeper devotion, to be a church that is all about your son and your glory and broken people living in the power of the spirit for the mission of the King. In your name I pray, amen.